welcome to Writer to Writer. I'm your host, Kat Filer, also known as KJ Filer. My guest today is Jeff Shaw, author of Lieutenant Trufant, the first in a series titled The Bloodline. Leanne and the Clean Man is the second in the series. The third and possibly final book is in the works. Jeff hopes to publish it before the end of the year. Lieutenant Trufant is his second novel. His first is a memoir published in 2020, Who I Am, The Man Behind the Badge, which Jeff, a police officer in South Florida for 24 years, wrote and published not long after retiring. It's a compelling collection of some of the most memorable cases he worked, how they affected him at the time, and how they still affect him today. When Jeff isn't writing, he's reading, playing golf, or traveling with Susan, his wife of 29 years. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing today? Hi. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, so let's just jump right in. Please tell us about the Bloodline series. Who are the characters? What's the setting? And tell us a little bit about the storyline. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant Trufant is um, a lieutenant with the San Francisco Police Department. Um, I was traveling with my family in uh, San Francisco in 2016, I think it was. And um, was sitting in the back of an Uber um, just enjoying the scenery. And I saw a homeless man walking down the sidewalk with a black Labrador. And I remember looking at those, those two and I'm wondering like, who is the supporter here and who's being supported, you know? Uh, um, what kind of life do these two have? And, you know, within 15 minutes, I was in the lobby of the hotel with my laptop open and that man and that dog became the characters in my first chapter for Lieutenant Trufant. Um, David Armstrong and Travis uh, were those two characters and they uh, run throughout the, uh, the book. Um, so uh, Lieutenant uh, Trufant comes in in the second chapter and we start learning about his life. Um, the struggles he's been dealing with trying to catch this serial killer who's killing homeless veterans in San Francisco. And he's got really nothing to work with um, until he learns that David Armstrong has witnessed the latest attack and now he has something to work with. And, um, so that's how uh, Lieutenant Trufant starts. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a hard crime novel I had, you know, when I was thinking of writing crime, it's, I, I know there's cozy crime and there's hard crime. And I just, I just didn't think I could do anything like a cozy crime. You know, I'm used to seeing blood on crime scenes and, you know, it's going to be in there and Lieutenant Trufant. I try and moderate it though. It's not something grotesque. I think yeah. it's a real novel um, with the Lieutenant Trufant and all his techniques of trying to track down this killer. No, I think you did a good job. At no time did I ever think, I don't think I can watch this, you know, in my head. It, it was well done. Right. So Thank you. You avoided all that. Um, and can you tell us about some of the other characters? Um, that's the first book. And then the second book is called Leanne and the Clean Man. Right. Leanne and the Clean Man. Leanne has a uh, small part in uh, Lieutenant Trufant. She comes in and out very quickly in different parts of the book. Um, she is the youngest daughter of the Haddad family who becomes a prominent, uh, prominent characters in the, in the novel. Um, and Leanne and the Clean Man is, although it's a sequel, it's her own story. Okay. Once um, it begins, Trufant never comes back into the story. It's her, on her own in Singapore. Um, she's fleeing the United States um, for things that happened in Tupac. Uh, I'm trying to avoid spoilers with, with her <laughs> character. But um, immediately at the Singapore airport, she's kidnapped by a gang of uh, drug and sex traffickers. And um, they don't realize who Leanne is. Leanne is, she's kind of my antic hero. She's a bit of a sociopath herself. Um, not quite the psychopath. She doesn't get any thrill out of killing anyone. She doesn't go hunting for victims. But once somebody crosses her path or does her wrong, 
uh, she suffers from OCD and she, it just gets to a point where the only way to um, get through this is to usually kill uh, the person who's wronged her. And of course, now she's got a whole list of people um, in this uh, sex and drug trafficking ring. And uh, she goes about uh, getting revenge and ultimately redemption also. Yeah. Uh, the experience changes her. And um, so we find ourselves rooting for this serial killer. Yeah. Um, you know, and there are stories like that. Um, I think in another interview I watched, you were talking about the girl with a dragon tattoo yes. having yeah. some similarity. And, you yes, know, we, I... we're all fascinated by her. Right. You know, I love that series, uh, the books. And then I watched, the, you know, the one um, movie with Daniel Craig. I thought it was excellent. Yeah. So when I started writing Leanne's character in Lieutenant Truffaut, I, I really never thought of um, Elizabeth Salander in, in that movie until I was almost finished with the novel. And then I started looking back at Leanne and what she does. You know, she pops in and out. Uh, she's kind of like the seagull that flies into the room and craps on everybody and then flies back out. Um, so I started thinking of Elizabeth, and I, I think I might have gone back and actually tailored her little parts in Trufant, um to be similar. She's a little eccentric. Uh, she doesn't like people touching her. She's not even her own family. She's an um, uh, introvert to an extreme and um, so as I was finishing her part with, you know, uh, the similarities with Elizabeth, somewhere around that time, I also watched the series Wednesday, the Wednesday Adam series. Yeah. Um, and so that character in Wednesday remind me some a little bit of Leanne also. So I was already writing the sequel of Leanne and the Clean Man. And so I kind of blended those two characters together. It seemed like it was an easy jump to, to, do, to do that. Um, yeah, her as a child and then her as an adult. Right, Because exactly. I mean, all your characters come from somewhere. Um, right. Are there any real life people that you wouldn't get sued for saying they were inspirations for these characters? Well, I'll tell you, Lieutenant Trufant, um, when I saw the man walking the dog, okay. not long before that, I had heard about this terrible attack that had happened in Iraq, where this family was brutalized by a group of uh, U.S. Army soldiers. Um, uh, some of the kids were raped, killed, the husband was, was killed, and uh, it took a long time for uh, those uh, soldiers to be tracked down, you know, because it happened in Iraq, there was some um, dis, uh, connection between the Iraqi police and our military. So it took a while, but they were all uh, arrested, tried, and all of them were sentenced to life imprisonment. That's, that's the true part of this story. So I had always thought of, what about those survivors? What, what happened to them? Yeah. Um, you know, your heart goes out to them. And when I wrote the first draft of Lieutenant Trufant, I had uh, that attack happen. And with a few beta readers, they said that they just could not live with reading this with our soldiers putting in such a bad light. Well, you know, soldiers are like anybody else, really. You know, there's, there's great ones. There's uh, a lot of really good ones, but just like uh, doctors and pilots and police officers, you're going to have that that small percentage of uh, men and women that uh, are the at the bottom or the dregs of society. So I had to agree with them, and I changed all of it to more like mercenaries, okay, um, like the Blackwater. Uh, a group that was, you know, in the, in the news back then about the same time. And to me, it felt like a relief to, to make that, that change. Yeah. And um, so you have that family of survivors that have uh, suffered greatly, and they play a prominent part in Lieutenant Tupac. And Leanne is the youngest member of that family. And was it genetics or was it... Um, 
something that occurred, you know, this attack or uh, growing up around her brothers and sisters who were also, you know, mentally damaged from, from all this. Uh, what caused Leanne to become the, the, the woman she is? So <clears throat> I, I, in, in all those characters, I tried to also uh, employ a little empathy with them mm -hmm. so that you understand that where they're coming from, what's, what has led them to be the people they are, even with Tufant, uh, David Armstrong. You know, when I start in chapter one on Tufant with David Armstrong, I start with you having no reason to like him at all. If anything, you have a dislike for him. Um, and you slowly start learning more about him and his past and, you know, you can't help but uh, liking the character and rooting for him, even in the bad times. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the most um, complex characters are really bad guys on the right. outside. But then when you get behind it, I mean, who of us hasn't seen Silence of the Lambs and, and don't right. we root for him, you know, I mean, right. on some level, you know, I, I, I don't know. The first time I ever watched it, I thought, well, I don't know why this guy is going to be interesting to us because he's such a horrible character. But then, of course, you have her giving the translation. And right. yeah, so I think you're right. There has to be some complexity. Right. So, I kind of made a study of uh, psychopaths and serial killers. Yeah. You know, I ran into a few of them at work. Um, so it's really interesting, like learning what uh, what signs and signals these people give out to what, mm -hmm. you know. They can be right next to you and you don't even realize who they are. You want to like that person because yeah. they're able to put on that facade of being normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. After reading books like yours, I'm uh, crazy, drive my husband crazy on the road now because I look around and I, I'll see panel vans or something and say, I hope there's not a woman in the back of that. I hope like, you know, yeah. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll talk to him about who the people are that are sitting behind us. You know, like I, right. I make up stories about everybody, but. It's authors like you that make me look around and see, oh, that's probably not what you think. It's something okay. else. So yeah. I have a I have a habit of profiling people, you know, not <laughs> maliciously or anything, but I always look at them and I try and read them, um, especially like first impressions, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and being a police officer, you're gonna look at people differently than right. the rest of us anyway. Right. I may I may find I find your your work really interesting and I think one of the reasons and we're going to talk about your other book in a minute but I think one of the reasons is because I grew up in Miami in a what you would consider a bad neighborhood I didn't know at the time that we were poor I didn't know <laughs> you know so but I learned to even as a child to look around and be situationally aware and uh, I remember being out with one of my friends who just grew up in um, high-end suburbia had never ever nothing bad had ever happened in her life and she said right. you know walking in public with you is like walking with a Doberman and I said, why? And she says, because you look at everybody, you're always afraid of something happening. And I said, I'm not afraid. I'm just looking, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? You know, so you, and that's a survival technique. You can't, it is. Right. yeah. So I found your characters really complex and interesting. And um, I try and, I try and weave a little bit of all my experiences into the characters. Yeah. Um, like you'll notice Tufant talking about profiling people in the park. Um, it's just a, second nature like a survival uh instinct that sure. you build up over time it, does, it doesn't just flood into you they can't train you to to do this you just start learning yeah uh, like on the job uh training and you start picking up on little signs mm -hmm. of problems yeah. um, and i i go into the that a lot in the memoir you know, yeah the yeah things. So let's talk about your memoir, um, uh, Who I Am, The Man Behind the Badge. And I haven't read that one yet, but I plan to. And um, this one is about your time as a police officer. Yes. Tell us about how that started. And yeah. All right. Um, well, you know, going through high school, I, I'll have to have to start there. Going through high school, I had a hard time. I, I wasn't one of the jocks or the band members or anything you know I was kind of the outcast and I think I was a little bit uh, of an introvert probably a lot more than a little but um, so um, I didn't have a lot of close contacts or friends back then um, so when I got out of or all through school um, I struggled with English 
believe it or not. That was my worst uh, subject, English. I just didn't understand the need to know what a proper paragraph required or where you put those little semicolons and commas. It just wasn't important to me. I wanted to be a pilot. That was like my big goal through, through you know, most of my, my school years. Um, so right after graduation, I went out, took flying lessons, got my license in 1972. And that was right about when the Vietnam was ending and all of these pilots and mechanics were all coming back into the States. And here I am with a hundred hours in a little Cessna and they have thousands of hours in, you know, complex jets and everything. So I quickly learned I, I didn't have a shot really at trying to make a career of aviation. So I bounced around through a lot of different jobs, construction, cooking in restaurants. And, and one day a friend of mine said, you know, you should uh, put an application to the Hialeah Police Department. They're um, giving a test, you know, in a couple of months. So, so I did. And that's a long story that I kind of described in the memoir about the difficulties just getting to take the test. And it was a two-year process. I got hired in 1979, went to the academy, was five months in the academy, and two things that happened in the academy that really stood out to me. About three weeks in, we had to attend an autopsy. And I always bring this up usually when I'm talking to somebody. I ask, how many of you have ever seen a dead person outside of a funeral parlor? You know, you don't see a lot of hands go up. Yeah. So here I am, I'm like two, three feet away from the stainless steel table. And there's this human being lying on it. Of course, he looks like he's sleeping. They haven't touched him yet. And then they do the full autopsy right there. And it's really hard to describe all the things that you're seeing and hearing and, and smelling. And uh, so, so it was difficult. But I managed and most of the class managed uh, to get through that. Then maybe a month later, they sent us back to our departments and we rode for a week as an observer um, in our little light blue, you know, police trainee shirt and everything. And uh, my officer and I were sent on a men fighting call in a field. You know, I'm walking in this waist high grass with my flashlight looking around. I don't see anything. And all of a sudden, here's this guy laying on the ground, laying uh, supine on his back. And he's got a screwdriver stuck in his chest. And he's wow. dead. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. That was, it was a big shock. You know, it's like hard to process at first. Over the years, that would become like a routine event, but that was a big shocker for me. So then five months, I'm back, I'm on the road with a training officer, field training officer, FTO. And um, that lasted two months. And then my very first night in the car by myself, my very first call was a mass shooting. Oh. So uh, to make a long story short, Minutes later, I'm, I'm kneeling down on the ground next to this man who's dying, and I'm telling him he's going to be okay. And then he dies. You know, you see it happen. You know, the eyes dilate and the breathing stops. You know, I'm feeling his throat. There's nothing there. And so I try and describe what that feels like when that happens. I try and put the reader right there in the room with me. And, uh, and then also what it felt like driving home that night. You know, once I'm finished with that call, they're sending me on more things. So you don't really have a, a chance to think about what just yeah. happened. So you think about it on the way home. And, you know, it's a, a strange thing. And I can still right now put myself right back in that room like it's happening today. And, uh, you know, every, every year, maybe those memories get a little easier to deal with. But uh, so that was my, my baptism of fire. So I did 24 more years. Uh, in my last three and a half years, I was in homicide. And I was already pretty experienced in dealing with death. You know, we go on a, some type of death call once a week, sometimes two in a single night. Usually it's a natural death. You know, somebody, an elderly person dies. But uh -huh. then you have suicides and the homicides and accidental deaths, traffic accidents. So by the time I was in homicide, it was no big shock to deal with death. The big change for me was actually sitting down at an interview and talking to the people who had just killed their husband or wife. Um, and why, you know, and you start really like getting into their uh, the psychology part of why people kill. 
and it's never the same and it's not what really what like you see in Hollywood these sometimes these are just regular people who just got pushed a little too far uh, lost control and um, and found themselves you know uh, suspect in a murder you know so you know after I retired and retiring was hard too you know I went from being a senior sergeant in homicide to being an unemployed man overnight, you know, and at first it feels like a long vacation and then the depression sinks in and my, some of my fellow retirees told me it would happen. Um, you know, you're just kind of wandering around. What am I going to do? You know, I'm unemployed. Do I, do I need to get a job or, you know, what's happening? So about that time, my father, uh, sent me and my brother and sister um, a 17 page letter of how he grew up and during the depression in South or in Miami Beach. And I thought that was really impressive. So I wanted to do something similar for my kids who were little when I was working. I used to drive them to school in my little, you know, detective car. They're used to seeing me with a badge and a gun and everything. They probably thought all the dads dressed that way. So about that time, I, I, I met some writers and they had started reading what some of the things I, I was working on. And like we, we discussed uh, the Atlanta Writers Club and uh, George Weinstein. And, and so these people really kind of shaped me into making that little, those little stories into a memoir that they thought would be good for me and maybe good for other people to mm -hmm. understand exactly some of the things that police officers go through. And it, I was also, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, they, you know, be helping other people. But um, I really thought it might help me to get those things out there. And also sort of an apology to my kids of why I maybe was a little stricter than some of the other fathers. And, you know, to my new friends, you know, if I seemed distant at times, you know, maybe it was, you know, these things. And to my wife, you know, uh, yeah. she has to live with me. <clears throat> so... So then it took about 15 years to get that book ready to publish. And I published it in 2020. Um, so that's three years now. And I've sold several thousand copies. You know, I remember at one time on Amazon, you could look and see where all of those copies went and, you know, went all over the country, you know, all 50 states. And I saw a bunch of them in Europe. Um, and so it was, Really interesting. I remember thinking, oh God, please let me get at least 10 reviews. And one of them would be a stranger, not a family friend or something, you know. And so uh, right now it has 231 reviews, I think. You know, That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Wow. I yeah. People, I had people calling me, you know, somehow finding out my number, saying, listen, I want to thank you, you know, for writing this. Now I know why my father was, you know, the way he was, or my husband, my wife, you know. So I think a lot of people, really it was an eye opener that uh you know we don't just sit on the side of the road with a radar gun yeah you know um and i try and bring that up and of course the police car in the donut shop you know that's another thing that uh people notice all the time but yeah, yeah. so I, I just describe what it's like to uh to go on these you know hard calls and um i feel very fortunate that i had that ability or that uh, um, career. It was probably the best years of my life, although they were, you know, stressful and dangerous and all that stuff. I never really felt the stress or the danger. It, to me, it was exciting and interesting. And I felt like I was doing good. Yeah. You know, sounds corny, but that's really the feeling you get sometimes when you go home at night. Yeah. You're, you know, you're, you're doing oh. good already singled that book out for something that my husband could read. He's not really a fiction reader. He will read with me sometimes if I'm, right. if I'm doing something with an author, he will, um, he will go along with me. Um, but he won't read by himself. Well, there's one author and I'm not going to say it here, but there's one author who has captured him and it was because he met him in person and he liked oh, him right. and he read the book and then he, now he won't let me have the book because <laughs> right. it's signed. So I have to get a, a Kindle version. But anyway, going back to this, um, your memoir is one that I have selected to share with my husband because his father was a police officer and he was a homicide detective. And um, uh, 
Richard was about 15 when his dad had a stroke and he became not functional really anymore as a person. And then he passed away. And so he never had the chance to sit down and talk with his dad. And I did flip through this a little bit. And I thought this is something that I would enjoy. Um, I was in uh, high school. I was in the, what did I think what they called it? Explorers. Right. Police yeah. Explorers. And I had thought about police work as a, even as a woman. And I had uh, gone on a couple of things that women don't typically do. Um, but I, I realized it wasn't for me, but I also realized that it, there might be other opportunities. I never did pursue it, but I really thought that I, I would be interested in forensics because of this. So, right. yeah. So I think that, that one of the things you're doing with the book is sometimes memoirs are telling somebody's story and sometimes memoirs are telling a greater truth. And as a police officer, you're looking for purpose in your life. So right. as a retiree, you're still looking for purpose in your life. And, um, and from what I have, just the scanning, because I've already bought the book, I really believe that my husband is going to enjoy this. And I see a purpose in there. It's not just a story. There is something to be learned and embraced. So, you know, there's there's some difficult uh, calls in, in that memoir, but there's also some great ones. You know, I mean, I had a lot of great experiences meeting people, helping people. Um, you know, I. I, I have a story in there where I want to say I saved this girl from drowning, but it's still hard for me to even say that. Yeah. It was like an accident, sort of. You know, I mean, I got I got the call of a little girl drowning in a lake, and I went into the lake and pulled her out, and um, I had her over my shoulder as I was running back to the house. Uh, I was trying to get to shore where I was going to do, you know, CPR, and, but I heard the fire truck trucks coming and I could see the their red lights coming through this glass door and out through the front door and I thought well I'm just going to keep running because they can do CPR better than I can so mm -hmm. that was my plan so you know as I'm running I you know she's over my shoulder I, I don't know what she was 10 years old maybe probably weighed 40 pounds um, I think that bouncing up and down kind of worked like a Heimlich maneuver or something and all of a sudden she started coughing and threw up down the back of my shirt and uh, oh, yeah, that's a touching moment. Yeah, no, I I get it. Um, Rick's dad, I didn't get to talk to him a lot, but there were a couple of times when he talked about his career, and it's a yeah. it's a gift to society. Honestly, I I know that people say nice things about police officers and what they you know the service and and soldiers too, but it is it is a gift and. So for you to sit down and write these things for us to read is it's more service towards, you know, other people. It, and, was, it was hard to write, you know. I mean, yeah, I bet. I remember sitting at the keyboard just weeping sometimes, you know. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and But the other thing, but, too, is you're not just sharing your experiences. You have the ability to write where right. you might know something or you might have stories to tell. But if you don't have the ability to write, then you can't do this. And you yeah. do. So, but yeah. the good part about all of this is it gives me a lot of experience where I can transfer those into fiction, you know, yes. a fictional novel. I can recreate or sometimes I take parts of different scenes and put them into one. And, you know, I, I feel like it's authentic, almost to a fault where some people believe that, you know, this can't really be happening. But, you know, it does. It does happen. But. Well, with uh, Lieutenant Trufant, if I hadn't known that you were a police officer when I started reading the book, I would have guessed that you might be. Right. So, yeah, you know, or something like that. So so let's switch gears for a minute. So Hollywood okay. Hollywood calls you, producer calls and says <laughs> they want to produce one of your novels. So which one, right. why? And then I want to know who plays the lead character. Well... I'd have to probably pick Lieutenant Trufant. Yeah. Um, I feel That's like my I favorite, but I'm reading it. That's, I, you know. I can relate to him well. Now, um, uh, I take a little bit of several different people and put into, make, that's how I made Lieutenant Trufant. A little, little bit of me in him. And there's also, I remember reading um, James Patterson's Alex Cross series, you know, the first four or five novels I wrote, I, I mean, I read, kind of got tired for me after the fourth or fifth one. 
but then I also watched the movie with Morgan Freeman and uh, Along Came a Spider and yeah. Kiss the Girls, I think it was was the second one. And I was just thought that, uh, you know, Morgan Freeman did an excellent job as a police investigator. But he's a little older now for my character. Um, so recently, or while I was finishing Trufant, I watched the series... Um, with Idris Alba, um, was it? Let's see. I don't know the name of the Luther. series, but I, Luther. Yeah. I want to okay, say yeah. Lucifer, but it's yeah. Luther. Um, it's a British um, uh, broadcasting series where he plays a detective that specializes in tracking down serial killers, and you see all the human frailties in him. The effects that all these years of investigating psychopaths has, has done damage to him. And so I would want to probably pick Idris Elba as uh, Lieutenant Trufant. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I, I don't know who I had in mind. I'm not finished. I'm just almost finished. I'm three quarters right. of the way through. But I, um, but I can totally see that. So, right. yeah. So did you always want to be an author? No. Quite the contrary. Like I, like I mentioned in high school, English was my worst subject. I just didn't understand why I needed to know all those things. And now, of course, I kick myself in the butt for not paying <laughs> attention. I can picture uh, Mr. Sullivan rolling over in his grave laughing that I was now an author, the guy that looked out the window all day long. You know. <laughs> so uh, when I went to the academy, all of a sudden I realized, you know, I have to write a police report. I have to write a narrative. And like, oh my gosh, you know, that proper paragraph, how do I do that? So um, I remember when in the first few months I would actually copy somebody else's burglary report. How did he, the phrases that he used, the uh, vernaculars, and how do you put all that in there? And it's really who, what, when, where, and how. What did I see? What did I do? No other information, or like we always say, NOI, uh, and then back in service. So I really learned how to do that. I would use like templates until I understood exactly what I needed to put in the report. And then I actually got pretty good at writing police narratives, arrest reports, I um, have to write evaluations for officers and uh, things like that. But once I got out of the, uh, out of the career and started trying to write those little stories, one of the first um, reviews I got from my friend was this reads like a police report you gotta <laughs> you gotta get away from that you gotta put some emotion in there some drama and emotion and those are the things you avoid in a police report so I had to learn how to do that and that's where the Atlanta Writers Club helped I joined you know so many different clubs and I would go to book signings and I would be all ears whenever a writer was talking about how they write a story yeah yeah. Um, and you do it well. So, Thank yeah. You. So for people who have, learning. yeah, well, we're all always learning and whatever book you put out, I was just talking to another author about this today. She was concerned that the book she just put out is not her best work. Of course it isn't because the next one will be better. And the right. one after that'll be even better, you know? So yeah, that's, that's a thing. But to, I look back at Lieutenant Trufant wishing I could rewrite it, you know, because yeah. I, I know I'm already a better writer. Yeah. You know, Leanne is a little better, and the one I'm working on now is um, is even better. I just yeah. feel it, you know. Which is a thing for readers when you're reading something. If you find out it was the first work, the second one's going to be so much better. Um, I uh, there, I have a favorite author, um, just a general author, Barbara Kingsolver, and I read her books backwards. And it was d disappointing because she became a worse writer with every book. Right. <laughs> so, the ones that she, uh, she had a series and um, so, but it was really funny because I, I was learning to write myself at the time. And I thought, oh, this isn't her, this is her first book. <laughs> I didn't read the first one. So that's funny, but you want to stick with the author because they get better and better. So what's the first book you've ever read cover to cover? Oh, good question. Um, when I, I want to say I was about 13 years old with my family on vacation. We stopped at the Florida one of the Florida Turnpike Rest Plazas. You know, I still remember they had these little water towers painted like an orange because we're in the middle of orange groves. And uh, I bought Robert Heinlein's um, 
the moon is a harsh mistress. It's not science fiction. And I, and I read it, I think I was almost finished by the time we got back to Miami. And uh, my mom took me to the library, got a library card, and I started checking out. And I think I read everything the man wrote yeah. um, over the years. And then, you know, I switched to other genres, you know, got into Stephen King, horror, and um, now I read just about anything but romance. Yeah. I can't well, romance. I'm even learning to read some romance, but it, there has to be another aspect of it. For me so you're talking about right. george weinstein his wife kim conry i i didn't think i liked romance and then i started reading her books and i realized i do like romance i just need another dimension yeah right. Right. so that was great um so um so you just already said that you read all the genres is there a favorite genre for you as a reader as a reader i still think i like a good science fiction novel and like i said i have one sitting in my hard drive that um, almost ready to deal with, but um, I, the, one of the best ones I've read recently was um, was and who did The Martian. Oh, uh, Andy Weir. Andy Weir just came out with one called Hail Mary. Oh yeah, I haven't. Read I it. thought it was fantastic. Oh, you've read it? Oh yes. Yeah. Um, um, it it was very technical, and uh, you know I struggled with a lot of the science and the technology and stuff. But I just thought it was so fresh. I'd never read anything yeah. similar. And that's what really excites me when I'm reading a book. You know, It's not yeah. the cookie cutter uh, story. Um, yeah. Then, uh, you know, like recently, I, I've kind of got away from the big names and I'm starting to read more independence. Yeah. And um, Robert Gwaltney, I don't know if you've heard of Robert or- I do i interviewed robert oh, i okay. read the cicada trees and wow just that's, that's my impression too was wow it's like you know i didn't think i would really i didn't even understand what southern gothic was you know which is apparently that genre mm -hmm. so uh i met him when i was up at the book found bookstore in blairsville i went there really to support the uh the owner of the bookstore and met Robert, listened to his um, talk about how he wrote um, The Cicada Tree and I bought the book and it sat on a shelf for a while because I was into other things trying to get uh, Leanne and the Clean Man uh, finished up. And then I opened it up and it was like, I think I read half the book that first night. Yeah. It was um, a very unique style of writing. It is. And, um, I remember talking to him after that saying, you know, it's almost like I'm reading lyrics of a song. Mm, yeah. Um, it ha has a musical cadence to it as you read. And it does have some music involved in it. You know, it's it does. like a piano prodigy, um, the, the little girl. But uh, so I really liked uh, uh, the, the cicada tree. I did. I, I really liked it um, for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons is... Um, well, I mean, he and I talked during his interview, I asked him what some of his influences were, and of course, Truman Capote. But then he also talked about the scene in, um, is it David Copperfield or no, Great Expectations, where the woman, she's a jilted bride and she's sitting right. in that room with the cake that's molding and all the, and right. he said it was just like any Gothic writer would, would right. like that. And I could totally see that. You know, that was one of the books they made me read in English. Was it? <laughs> Were you and scarred? that's the only scene I can remember. <laughs> yeah, it's the only that, one. I... That, the dining room, you know, with that, yes. all the, the cake and all the silverware and the yeah. china and everything, you know, all molding and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I mean, that scarred you for life. It did. <laughs> so, anyway. So, um, is there a question I haven't asked that you wished that I had? Um, you know, I could talk for hours, as you probably can already tell, but um, I do want to say that uh, people have asked, so I'm working on the third uh, in the series, the Bloodline series, and in it, there's a combination of uh, Lieutenant Trufant and Leanne, um, kind of an unusual uh, partnership between the two of them. I mean, he's still a law member of law enforcement you know he's a police officer with 
uh, all those morals that are tied to it. And then you have Leanne who killed one of his main suspects and uh, um, is, is a psychopath, you know, kind of, sort of, and, and how they're going to get along and accomplish the goal in this novel. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. So, um, yeah, again, it's, it's, I, I looked at it as a challenge to bring those two together. And I find myself taking on these challenges sometimes when people <laughs> say, oh, you can't do that, you know. Um, and so I have to try it. Yeah. You know, make it work. Yeah. And when do you think that'll I'm really be out? Good. I'm about 75, 80,000 words into it now. Oh, okay. And I so... want to get it up to around 95. Okay. Um, and I think that would be a real realistic thing. And then get it off to the editor. So when can we expect that to come out? Well, you know, it's really, you know, I want to say, you know, once I finish and send it off to the editor, it's not that easy because, you know, you, you yeah. got to, you know, she could have say, oh, I'm busy this month and I can take it at the end of next month and yeah. it'll take me a month. And then, then, you know, I have to make all my changes and then get it to the publisher. And then that's another monthly yeah. thing. So I'm still, I'd still like to think that I'd have it out by Christmas. That would be nice. In time That's, for, um, I hope yeah. I'm not being op optimistic. Well, I hope it's out. And then, you know, to the listeners, books are the best ever gifts. Yes, and, they are. You know, you don't even have to ship them or wrap them. You just order them and send them. It's great. Yep. <laughs> so also, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute here and say to readers, if you have read any of these books or if you didn't, but you do now, please leave a review. Okay, everybody needs a review. So um, obviously some people have left you some, so that's great, but yeah, always leave a review. I, I really noticed like with the memoir, it really took off once I got to around 50 reviews. I don't know yep. what it was, but um, you know, and like Lieutenant Trufant is right on that borderline right now. So mm -hmm. he well, could use love. Somebody just recently told me what happens at 50 reviews. I didn't realize that. But at 50 reviews, Amazon also starts um, publicizing. You start getting into email blasts and stuff. If you get up to 75, they start email blasting you to readers right. and suggesting Great. it. So, yeah, that's nice. So the review is a big deal. And I don't know about for you, but with me, and I'm sure that it's the same thing. For me, a review is more than a way of publicizing my book. It's I a reader read something was touched enough to actually reach out and say something to me and right. for me books whether i'm reading or whether i'm writing are a way of having a conversation with people you'll never meet so right. yeah i love that or people who came before or people who haven't been born yet so that's great so sort of a, I, have, of I have one little story to tell I, okay i, I thought yeah. of it earlier it just takes a second so the other day out of the blue my phone dings that little thing that i have a message from messenger you know and I don't get to a lot of those. So I look at the name and it's a woman I know from work. She's also on my Facebook uh, thing. And it was kind of shocking because she was, I just remember her as being a very quiet um, clerk typist with the department. Um, and she says, you know, I just want to tell you how much I enjoyed uh, reading your reports at work. She was one of the people that would take my handwritten report or even the computerized report and enter it into the database. You know, she would write the narrative and everything, and then it would be on permanent file, you know, within the department. Uh, she says, she said something like, some of those reports were so boring, but I always looked forward to seeing one of your reports. And I thought, oh, you know, how nice is that? You know, um, even way back, you know, I've been retired, I don't know, 20 years, and uh, this, this woman remembered, remembered that and, and reached out to me and told me. I thought oh. that was fantastic. Has she read your book? I don't remember her saying. Okay. Uh, she... I don't remember that being part of her story, but just that she was re remembered my reports yeah. from work. I thought yeah. was great. Yeah. Well, and, and writing is easy. As, I mean, it's not easy. And it's also lonely sometimes. So yeah. when somebody reaches out, it's a big deal. So I know yeah. I, um, I had said something in an interview about if my publisher told me that I wasn't getting any more money, that I was just living on reviews. As long as I get reviews, I'm good with that. And he's <laughs> like, OK, right. let's make a deal. No. <laughs> right. So but still. Yeah. Well, Jeff, it's been an honor and a pleasure. I hope you will keep us in mind for your next book when it comes out so we could you know, do something for your launch. Um, we would love to have you back. 
Um, and for listeners, as usual, I will post links below so you can find Jeff, his books, and stay up to date on his latest adventures. It has been awesome, Jeff. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.